what I'd like to see is, you know, some of these micro schools that are doing really amazing things mm -hmm. from, you know, around the country, around the world, be credited for the kinds of things that they're doing. Like right. I told you the story of, of Faye, you know, as we, as we open, there's amazing things happening at our school community and, and around the country. And I think that it's, that is being ig ignored or unsupported at the peril of our society. Right, right. Uh, this is the Agentic Schools Podcast, where you will learn about schools from around the world, where children's agency to make decisions about their learning and living is more important than their academic skills. I'm your host, Don Berg. Hello and welcome. This is the Agentic Schools podcast. I'm here with uh, Michael Carberry of uh, Whole Life Learning Center in Austin. Is that right? Cool. That's cool. correct. So I like to start off, tell me a story about a learner or a family that really um, sucked the marrow out of the experience you have to offer, it, you know, really took good advantage of what you do as a school. <laughs> uh, I, I, for a second, I thought you were going the other direction with that, like suck the life out of me <laughs> and my my desire to run a school. No, no. Um, that someone who really took advantage of what we have to offer. Oh, that's a great starter. Um, I'm going to tell you the story of Faye. And... Faye was one of our first whole life learners. Uh, the first program that mm. I started was in um, 2010, and we called it Freedom Fridays. So mm. I met Faye and their family um, then. And uh, in Freedom Fridays, we had such an amazing year of emergent learning um, where mm. we really created the container and we built our curriculum based on all the inspirations of the learners. And it was from that first year of Freedom Fridays that the whole Life Learning Center really, really grew out of that. So this, mm. so Faye was, um, you know, one of, in one of the founding families of uh, the whole Life Learning Center and you know, came all the way through. And what we really got to observe what in, in mentoring this youth was um, just prolific creativity, writing mm. scripts for plays, you know, at age nine and 10 and directing them, um, in, in incredible art, creative writing, um, getting into world building and creating mm. these, um, you know, these kind of role playing worlds with their friends, um, all sorts, you know, that creativity that we really loved nurturing and seeing what kinds of projects and things could that came from those passions. Mm. Um, so fast forward um, a little bit and the, you know, one of the frequently asked questions that we get, if not the um, highest FAQ is where do, where do kids go after mm. the whole life learning center? You know, all the parents want to know that. Do they, can they go to public high school and be <laughs> successful or where, where do they go? I, and I, say they go wherever they want because mm -hmm. they ha they are um they they've learned to be self-directed autodidacts like mm -hmm. they are at at the wheel of you know the steering wheel of their life as whole life learners and so i we really got to see this uh, Faye was an incredible example of that uh, authentic steering of their own life nice. um so went on to um homeschool in a, in, for their high school career, um, working with the homeschooling co-op, in fact, leading um, classes with her peer group on um, Japanese cultural studies and hmm. world building and et cetera, et cetera, um, creative writing and art. Um, started taking classes at the local community college and during the high school years and getting those hmm. college credits. Um, came back one fall and said, 
Yeah, Mr. Michael, can we rent the the dome? We have a geodesic dome on on Any. campus, and can we rent that? I'm I'm leading a youth Shakespeare troupe, and we're going to compete at the the festival in Houston. And I said, yes, and no no charge. You know, come come back, do that. And nice. so that's they continued to really author their lives um, in the the, the post. Um, uh, elementary middle school years with us mm -hmm. and um, and then is now currently a double major in psychology and English at St. Edwards University in Austin a wow. uh, pretty prestigious uh, private university here and our it just so happened that um, the auditorium that we found for our eighth grade graduation last year was at St. Edwards mm -hmm. and Faye gave the commencement speech, and it was just a really cool full circle event. Their siblings, um, one other sibling has graduated, and there's another sibling in uh, middle school with us now. So the whole family mm -hmm. have been whole life learners. The, they have really embraced and, and they embody what it is to be, for us, a, a whole life learner. And so to see Faye up on stage, mm -hmm. um, you know, they also come back and, and sub and, you know, work with the kids. And <laughs> I can remember even, again, at those, that age of nine and 10, um, Faye saying, like, I can't wait till I can come back and be a whole life mentor. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and that day is, is already here where they are, um, yeah, coming back and subbing and, and working with, with the kids and inspiring them and, and showing them, modeling that mm -hmm. uh, inspired lifelong learning. So nice. that's, yeah, that's a family and a, a learner that really, um, that really embodied the essence cool. for us. Cool, very cool. Yeah, we really lo love to, you know, have that to as a, as a grounding. And now we can sort of talk about some more mundane details. Like, um, sure. <clears throat> you're in Austin. Sounds like K8. Um, so, so tell me about the the kind of community that you serve, and kind of you know a little more about just the the day to day of what your school is about. Yeah, so we're in South Austin. Our um, we serve families with kiddos ages uh, well pre pre K through mm. eighth grade, so okay. ages three to fourteen. Mm. We also it's I think in, important to say that you know we. We don't just work with their kids. We work with whole families. We have a robust mm -hmm. parent, you know, parent ed program with lots of enriching, you know, the community itself, sharing their offerings. Um, so we're really supporting the, the parents and whole families. We also, um, my wife uh, is an, um, an owner and, and main teacher for the Austin Permaculture Guild. So we have permaculture workshops, which is essentially the art and science of sustainable design. Mm -hmm. And she's an, um, she's an herbalist, so she's um, hosting uh, community herbalism days and doing workshops in, in that regard as well. So our, we're more than just a school for pre-K through eighth grade, you know, families with those ages kids. We've got people coming from all around Texas and the Southwest to come and learn and study with us, even if they don't have kids. Right on, right on. And, so, so um, it's a, a yeah. larger, a larger vision of uh, not just you're not just you didn't just start a, a program or a school. You started a, a you know permaculture like center. Yes, we we really nice. um, from the inception we really envisioned a uh, a community center, a hub okay. where people could gather around shared values and the, mm. the vision and mission that we embody. Um, and uh, so yeah, we're on a couple acres. Um, and we've got chickens and permaculture gardens, a food forest, a pond. Um, when we when we moved in onto this property 10, 11 years ago, it was pretty much a blank slate, a big mm. empty kind of front lawn, you know, with patchy weeds. And <laughs> we, you know, we did, we started even before the, the kids came onto that, that campus, we started with the earthworks so that we mm. were catching water and, and capturing, you know, th those resources and really bringing it back into the land and um, we started doing the workshops and through those workshops we were planting the trees we've planted mm. over a hundred fruit trees and um, you know the the chickens are enriching the soil and providing the um, you know food that we can share with the community and the the pond is a great ecosystem that we've got going up there especially in the Texas heat these yeah, days animals are very glad to have a, a little watering hole 
Mm-hmm. Um, we just this year opened our middle school. We were able to acquire oh. the property, um, adjacent property, and now our the big kids, the sixth, seventh, and eighth graders, have more of their own space to spread out into. That's on another acre um, wow. that we're excited to keep um, developing that land and, and stewarding that land in that way as well. Um, nice. Yeah. Very cool. So tell me, if you, uh, um, you, you mentioned earlier, or there was something you said that reminded me of this, but, but what are some of the kind of education myths that get in the way of parents choosing your place or that, that kind of makes it difficult to communicate about what you do? Right. Yeah. That frequently asked question of where do they go yeah. from here is also right. like, <laughs> do they do implied or under that or sometimes asked, asked explicitly is, do they do okay if they're going to transfer, if they need to transfer out in third grade and, you know, and then, and uh, of course every learner is different, right? And they're right. all at, at different, at different places. I think one of the biggest myths that we, um, work to uh, combat is this idea of being ahead or behind, especially mm. that, uh, you know, might, will, uh, you know, are they behind? Um, right, and right. I always want to make it, right. So I always want to make it clear that learning is not a race. And yeah. yes, there are, you know, stand, there are standards that have be, exist out there and they're not completely arbitrary in terms of human development. Um, However, um, the most important thing as learners is that we are um, that we're bringing an awareness of where our growth edge is, where our, our mm. learning edge is in different areas. We may have, we certainly will have stronger areas and more right. challenging areas um, as far as our development and learning. The most important thing is having awareness around those, assessing, and putting attention on those. So supporting mm. without getting. Um, without the child feeling lost or overwhelmed, right. but also not like, oh, this is too easy. So having that differentiation in the classroom is so important to us and meeting every learner right where they are and not mm-hmm. stigmatizing that they're struggling with, with reading or math or whatever it might be. Right. So that's, yeah. a, that's a big kind of cultural myth that if they're not reading by age right. six, they're behind or, um, you know, and we're, we're, we're you know, we work to um, engender that trust, you know, yeah. trust the process, trust in, you know, your child's natural development um, mm-hmm. and, and the perfect timing for, you know, for that. Um, so I would say that's a big one. Um, and, you know, we, we like to blend a, a balance of academic rigor and just open space for the emergent mm. learning um, and the creative space and but it's about um, you know some people think if you're not if, if it's not like really bringing the rigor and piling on the homework and really doing mm. that that right. <laughs> they're not going to be able to keep up right in this this competitive society and I think quite the opposite that that Mm -hmm. happens you know in those situations is the burnout and the i hate school or i hate learning even worse right and so the flip side of that is nurturing the love of learning making Mm -hmm. it relevant finding connecting it to their their interests and their passions so that it just it takes hold and then Mm -hmm. pretty much then pretty soon they are um there you don't have to put things in front of them because they're seeking out their learning adventures. Right. You know? <laughs> right. um, so I think that's another myth that you have to, um, you have to really drill in the academic rigor to, to, to thrive um, in that academic world. And right, I think right. much more slowing it down, listening and mm-hmm. making it, making it fun so and relevant. One of the things that I like to kind of uh, explore in this is also what you might say, like we talk about academics and, and there's a sort of um, conversation that happens around, well, children need structure. And of course, what they usually mean is that kind of pile on homework and, and have it be, you know, stressful and, and competitive. Um, but I think that there's also uh, uh, needs to be more conversation about what kind of social structures surround that instructional piece. Um, mm-hmm. So, so you know, kind of having 
the, like you're describing a social structure that's a little bit different than just you get assigned to a teacher, you do the work they they tell you to do. You know, you're talking about something that's a little more tuned into. Oh, who are you, and and what do you want? So, so I'm curious what the social structure in your environment looks like. Yeah, you know, so much uh, we we talk a lot about content when we're talking about mm -hmm. learning. Yeah. What's the you know the certain curriculum and what math curriculum do you use and this kind of content? But so much learning is happening in the context that we set right. for that learning, right? So rather than a context of coercion. Um, and uh, authority, we're creating a context of collaboration, of mm -hmm. inspiration and cooperation, that we're, we're on a team, we're working together. So we, as far as our, the structures that we create, we call ourselves mentors, as you heard mm -hmm. me referring, mm -hmm. and, and learners. Um, we're not just teachers focused on teaching certain subjects, but we're mentors who are focused on supporting the the holistic growth of whole human beings mm -hmm. all right and they're learners meaning whole life learners like this is this is something that we we came in naturally doing and we want to support that so we we create that that um um you know that kind of context we have mm -hmm. small um we have low ratios and team teaching so we have mm -hmm. sometimes a lead and a support mentor sometimes we'll have two co-leads, um, co-mentors in a classroom. Um, we have our cl classes capped at 22, um, 22 to maybe 24, so no more than a 1 to 12 mm -hmm. ratio. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, so that gives that time to, you know, have for, you know, maybe one mentor is, is leading uh, a lesson while the other one can be supporting individuals, mm -hmm. um, breaking off into small groups and Two mentors can be floating and checking in and supporting the group work or the independent work. Mm -hmm. um, we, we bring, as far as uh, referencing other educational models, we mm -hmm. do blend in Montessori methods and tools. Our preschool um, and our lower elementary especially has a lot of the Montessori works on the shelves. Mm -hmm. um, so we do bring, we also have mentors that have Waldorf experience that uh, mm. myself, I did my Waldorf foundation studies. Then my first um, job in Austin was at the Austin Waldorf school and mm. did my training there. So we, we blend in um, Waldorfian approaches as well. Um, with this, that, that um, real focus on uh, natural learning environment, really, mm -hmm. you know, this, having the aesthetic set and, really creating that, that kind of sweet and soft um, mm. environment for the young ones to be held in and nurtured in and not rushing the early academics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so those are some, some structures that we have there. Um, yeah. So also in particular um, around sort of um, like conflicts and how do conflicts get resolved? Mm -hmm. um, and and yeah. yeah, so what's that look That's, like? Yeah, that's a huge part of what we do because, again, the the context that we're in, the the way that we um, handle those things is a lot of the learning is is happening in those conversations through those relationships. Mm -hmm. um, so rather than a, a context of you know authority and obedience and rule breaking and punishment, we create the context of of conflict resolution of really a community of care that mm. that is the context for why we um, are addressing things that you know have that feel off so we use the um, the umbrella of restorative justice as a, a mm. framework for how we handle conflict resolution um, that is essentially you know most of the schools I know the school that you know, schools that I grew up going to most traditional schools, Really, their their um, way of handling discipline is based off the criminal justice system. Right. Uh, we need to find out uh, what law was broken, who's guilty, and what should the punishment be. Mm -hmm. Of course, completely leaving out uh, the victim in this sense. Um, where restorative justice, we're asking uh, who was hurt, um, mm -hmm. you know, physically, emotionally. Um, who is responsible for that injury and what can they do to repair 
or mm -hmm. restore um, from that from that injury that was caused. And so we're giving them the opportunity to create healing. So we use, you know, our staff is trained in nonviolent communication, or mm -hmm. conscious languaging. Um, mm -hmm. We use that, and we use that to model um, so that eventually we're 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 passing off these tools, you know, in the way that we mm -hmm. model our our communication and conflict resolution, so that they can more and more be empowered to solve their own issues when they when they come up or they have mm -hmm. a disagreement or um, you know someone's toes metaphorically or otherwise have been stepped on. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I have a, uh, a brief story I can share sure. on, on uh, a conflict resolution that really touched me um, and was affirming, um, nice. you know, very affirming for what we do. Um, mm -hmm. This was some years back. Um, I'll, I'll call the girl Lucy. Um, and this was the first week of school. It might have been, it might have even been the second day. And these were, this story involves two kiddos who were just starting at the Whole Life Learning Center. So mm -hmm. they, they, they had both come from public school backgrounds, and for one reason or another, their family said, we need something else. We need, mm -hmm. um, you need to try this place out. <laughs> um, so I was observing. We had a new art teacher um, that year, and I was in supporting and observing the class. When I noticed Lucy just had tears in her eyes, and she was just just seemed crushed and I I checked in I said hey you all right she said, yeah, fine fine I said hey come on over here let's let's step to the side we can check in and um, eventually she you know she didn't want to share but eventually she shared and she said Hank said that my they were doing self-portraits mm. Um, and they were meant to be quick draws, right? They were just, um, just kind of trying something out. And uh, she said, Hank said my picture was ugly. And uh, I said, okay, all right, well, let me, let me just check in with him. So um, we're checking in with, with Hank as well. And I said, hey, Lucy said this. And she said, no, I, I didn't say that. Mm -mm. Mm -hmm. during the headlights, you know, right, and right. so I, I, I made sure I was down at his level. I wasn't mm -hmm. towering over him. I, I consciously softened my voice and my posture. And I said, Hey, you're not in trouble. Mm -hmm. I just, you know, I, I, let's, I, I'm looking at Lucy's face right now and I don't think she's, you know, has any reason to make this up. What, you, what, what happened? And he softened and he said, yeah, I said that. I'm really sorry. And and this in this wonderful, brilliant display of self-awareness, he said, "Sometimes I just say things without thinking." Mm. And I said, "Wow, that's that's really wise, Hank." Um, and she accepted the apology. She said, yeah. "Okay." Thanks. And then he really tried to build her up. He said, hey, you're, I bet you're an awesome artist. Like, you know, he was just like becoming her cheerleader and just really got to it. And, um, but that context of, oh, wait, I'm not in trouble. You right. know, kids still ask that sometimes. Like, am I in trouble? I'm like, no, you're, you're in my office. You're, this is, this isn't trouble. Um, <laughs> I don't, you see any detention slips on my desk? We don't have those here. We yeah. just, if someone's hurt, we, we talk about it. We find a solution. We, 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 we try to help them out. So from, from there, this was one of the last classes of the day and the parents were picking up. And so here's Lucy with the puffy swollen mm -hmm. eyes and the red face. And so I, I go out to catch, um, yeah, mom at the, at the pickup. And I said, Hey, you know, this incident happened, um, at the, at this last class, but we were able to talk about it and have some resolution. I just wanted to let you know, um, you know, they're, they're driving through traffic all the way from North Austin. We just, we, you know, we really wanted a, this school to be a good fit and okay, we'll, we'll talk about it. You know, and I'm just like, okay, all right, we'll see, <laughs> we'll see what they think about this school. And, um, the next morning, uh, dad's dropping off and I said, Hey, how was, how was the conversation? Was she able to process a little bit? And he said, yeah, actually, you know, we share our highlights at the dinner table and Lucy said her highlight of the day yesterday was that when she cried and had to talk about something with another classmate, that he didn't get in trouble. Because mm -hmm. at her last school, 
she she's sensitive and would cry when her feelings got hurt and when other uh you know classmates at her previous school then would right. get in trouble they'd have to stay in from recess how did that help lucia how did that work out for her and her social relationships right 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 she was a pariah she had she she got teased even more and had such a hard time right and would just shut down was really that's why her parents were like we need to find something else and they so they said so that was literally her highlight was that nice. she's what she said was we were able to talk about it mm-hmm Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that little shift, you know, in the way that we handle, we, we, we prioritize um, the e- emotional safety, you know, mm-hmm. and that uh, and supporting that emotional intelligence in all of our learners so that they're, when these things happen, it's not that it's bad and needs a punishment. It's that right. these are learning opportunities and we're, we're teaching how to be more you know, conscious communicators, how to be more emotionally intelligent and compassionate with each other. And that's the, it's a huge part of the work um, and the the skills we need for the 21st century. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so would you say that the uh, processes that you use are um, sort of adult facilitated and, or, or are there, are there ways that you have like the peers the kids handling it with each other. How does that look? Yeah, we we have had um, certain iterations of that. You know, where we've um, had, uh, you know, they have certain armbands or something that they mm. were the um, uh, folks who were available. So we've done trainings with usually our upper elementary or middle school learners. Um, mm-hmm. So we would train them in our NVC and conflict resolution. Um, methods and nice. that they would be available if something was on the playground this is someone you can you can go to um, we also do um, we use a curriculum called learning for justice um, mm. and uh, that I'm trying to remember what it was formerly called it was um, uh, doesn't matter learning learning for justice right. <laughs> one of their lessons is um, talking about bystanders upstanders and whistleblowers and Mm. so we have that lesson early on in the year every year so what does it mean to be a bystander you're Mm. watching while someone else is maybe um you know being um made fun of you know Mm. for example Mm. right Right. and you don't say anything an upstander you're standing up for for um a classmate uh who's out there and how that's you know any one of us can be an upstander and how important that is. Mm. Otherwise, we're tacitly approving of that kind of um, behavior and that doesn't fit with our values. Um, And then, you know, whistleblowers where you might not feel like you're able to handle a situation yourself and you may Mm. need to ask a mentor for help. And that's important also. That's not telling on someone. That is caring for your community. That is Mm -hmm. helping do that. And, you know, so in that, in that restorative justice, we talk about how a community is a, is a web. And, you know, I, I often use the, the analogy of a a tapestry, you know, Mm. and and if someone, if something's out of line and something with our, our values and our agreements and someone's being hurt, it's like there's a tear and a tangle in that, in that web. And then there's a response and and we all feel it. Um, Mm -hmm. So it's, it's so important that we, um, that we are all prepared to take responsibility where we can and make those make those repairs. So mm-hmm. yeah, that's absolutely baked into our um, our curriculum, and we're, mm-hmm. we work to empower um, the youth to handle that wherever they um, those situations um, whenever they can. Mm-hmm. We've also mm-hmm. set up in in the back playground if something comes up, say during free play, we have um, a peace path. So we've got these painted pavers, Mm -hmm. each with a a station in the, like the NVC process Uh, for talking about, you know, what happened, what were your, what are your observations, what were your feelings, what are your needs, do you want to make any requests, Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, them being able to kind of walk that path, have a little bit of guidance, but do that independently. Nice, nice. Yeah, having a physical embodiment of it. Uh, of right. the process. That's really nice. That's really nice. Um, so, so you're, um, you're, 
pre-K through 8, um, and it sounds like you've kind of added a new space for your middle schoolers. Is that something that, like, like how much of your age mixing is it goes on? Like, is it is it sort of they're over there now and, and the rest are here, or, or is it sort of come and go and fluid? <laughs> yeah, it's pretty fluid. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they do have their space, and that is, you know, especially at that age and stage, feeling that autonomy, you know, they're mm -hmm. discovering and claiming more of their independence and identity, and that I think is helpful in that. And they are regularly... Um, back on the campus. Like I said, it's an, an adjacent property. Mm -hmm. uh, it's actually two doors down, so it's not... Oh, interesting. Um, we, we, yeah, we weren't able to to just take down a fence and just be <laughs> one big campus with another building. Um, maybe eventually we'll get that, that property <laughs> in between us. Um, when, I'm sure when the timing is just right, the... Uh, the funding will be there too. All right, right, exactly. <laughs> um, so what we did, there's a sidewalk behind the school and uh, up front, it's, uh, it's a little busier road. So we put a gate in on the back mm -hmm. fence with a coded entry. Um, so they're able to um, walk out the gate. We have reading buddies. They're coming over and, and using the the playground on the main on the elementary campus mm. um, at least once a week just to have that intermingling and connection with other learners and the, you know there's siblings between right. the middle school and the elementary as well um, they also share electives with the upper elementary so mm. um, theater and music class they, they are mixing and mingling in there as well mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and for some some um, project-based learning things they will end up coming together on, mm -hmm. on projects and field trips. So do you do you have a, a like a, like a time schedule kind of thing? Like what what does a typical day look like? Yeah, we we do, and um, we we like to find that that balance between having a, a rhythm and mm -hmm. a, you know kind of based on like in breaths and out breaths through mm -hmm. the day, you know and. Um, so having the structure and the freedom and spontaneity to move mm. within that structure. Um, we have a curriculum guide, and in my, my guidance to the Whole Life Learning Mentors, um, I say, think of this like a coloring book. And there are, you know, there are these, these pages, you get to choose your colors and fill in these, these certain classes with your own... Um, uh, with, with your own spectrum, you know, your own mm. flavors of, of colors that you want to bring. And you're even encouraged to color outside the lines sometimes mm. and, you know, just mix it up and, and be inspired. That's That was so important for me as a teacher that mm. I wanted to make sure that it was um, part of our model. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I also say we're, we never pour, pour concrete around our curriculum. We'll never... <laughs> print off this curriculum guide and say, this is the way it is and must be and will be forever. Right, um, right. That it's always an evolving process. And that's based on who's showing up. You know, some mentor shows up and is um, incredible with um, textiles and weaving mm. and like, bring that, please. You know, another one shows up and, and is, you know, experienced in theater and bring that, please, we want that. And you can weave that into a language arts class or mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. a math class or all sorts of areas. So we have that kind of space. The, to answer your question, the rhythm and structure of the day, we start with some openness and free play as everyone's mm -hmm. arriving. We're out on the playground. Um, then we start our circling song. Mm. Mentors play ukulele and guitar, and the classes find each other, and they circle up for a morning circle. Um, we every morning we that morning circle is focused on our social emotional learning. Mm -hmm. um, our um, so every week we have a theme of the week. Mm. Um, this last week's theme was inspiration. Next week's theme is kindness, um, and so with that theme, and there'll be other themes like collaboration and creativity and perseverance and determination and um, all sorts of things that are really um, like meta learning, learning how to learn. It's the mm. foundation for all the other learning that happens. So we really prioritize and value that time where we're talking about those SEL themes. Mm -hmm. We have a quote that goes along with it, some inquiry. It's not very didn't. didactic. It's, you know, mm. we're asking questions and getting the learners to discuss this 
you know, where does inspiration come from? What are some things you're inspired about? We're mm. getting to know each other. And, and then there are like games, songs, and activities that extend from that for that circle time based on, on the age group and the, what the mentor would like to bring to it. Mm. Um, from there, we'll have a snack. Um, go, you know, again, these in-breaths and out-breaths. And uh, we go into a morning work cycle. Um, mm. Anywhere from 90 to uh, minutes to two hours or, or a little bit over that for the middle schoolers. Um, and that's where the, we're, we're doing the core academics that will, that's math practice time mm-hmm. as well as language arts. Mm-hmm. Um, so in that morning work cycle, sometimes that looks like a group lesson. It often looks like introducing, um, you know, some concepts and uh, ideas and skills and then breaking off into small groups or individual work um, where the mentors are able to float around and support learners at their own level. Mm-hmm. Go into from there into lunch and free play. Um, and in the afternoon, we have our, our specialty classes and other homeroom classes. So okay. once a week, the science and social studies. Um, we have specialty classes including eco studies so that's mm-hmm. our focus on sustainability it's not just gardening but right. uh-huh. they're focused on all sorts of things we do eco audits for our school mm-hmm. and the kids actually apply for grants through a program called eco rise nice. um, so they do an eco audit whether they're auditing our um, water on water usage on campus um, air quality um, there's transportation, food production, soil, um, and waste, um, mm-hmm. and uh, meaning all the trash, recycling, right. compost systems that we have. So every year they get they apply for different grants to, um, and and they have to show their data that they've collected right. and how <laughs> their project could change these the trajectory mm-hmm. of these certain mm-hmm. data points. It's really cool. Um, that's eco studies. I mentioned theater, music, art. Um, we have a, um, a self, a body awareness class. It's called Life mm. Kido. Um, so it's, there's martial arts. It's really about um, awareness through the body, nice. um, which is another program that we, that we use called, uh, called Awareness Through the Body that, um, that we weave in there as well. Um, so I'm sure, you know, and then there's the emergent. Um, mm. so we have, we have one open space called whole life learning mm. where it's all project based learning. We, we put things out there like, um, all right, this semester or over these next uh, few months, we're going, are, we're going to start a um, class businesses. Um, mm. sometimes it's for the youngers, it's one big class business. Mm-hmm. Sometimes for the olders, they're groups of three or four or five and they make a small group and run and do their businesses. Um, we're, this this semester we're going to come up with a service project. Mm-hmm. This one we're coming up with a. We, in spring we have our spring showcase. So mm. you, we're using this space to work on a performance of any kind, any visual art, any group performances, and they're rehearsing and writing and mm-hmm. uh, creating. So we have lots of space uh, for that as well. So one thing that um, I, I found that there are schools that have developed just within their own community a certain jargon or a code word for something and so do you have you you've been around for a while so so you probably you may have one of these but what's one kind of jargon or code word in your school that might actually be really good if other people learned it oh it's easy it's this is the symbol and this is love and respect Mm. And these are the core values of our community. And when we sit down in, in circle, um, you know, mm. these, these fingers go up and the kiddos, you know, are helping everyone to remember what love and respect looks mm. like in this situation. Um, and so those are those are core values for, for us. And that's a big reminder. We also, um, the other one that um, all the kids would would certainly know is we say, um, kind of a call and response when we say, ah, go, and everyone will say, ah, may. Mm. And that means um, the, the longer in, uh, interpretation of that is, I am asking your permission. May I have your permission to speak? I have something mm. to share. And yes, um, you have our permission. We're listening with love and respect. 
Um, so that's that's one of our our code words out there. Nice, nice. Ago ame. Ago ame. I like that. <laughs> Very nice. Um, so so thinking bigger about like beyond the the immediate of kids in this in the space. Um, th- tell me a little bit about the the bigger context in which you're situated. Um, and if there are any things that you see that might be concerning about, you know, like your, your larger kind of legal and and uh, societal context, are there are there things kind of beyond the school that that are of of concern to you or that are interesting or, or whatever? But but just kind of give a bigger context of where you're situated. Sure. So philosophically, we are um, focused on holistic education, and mm-hmm. for me, that is. Uh, comes back to not pouring cement around the okay. curriculum <laughs> that we're not going to say this is the way it, it is and must be and will always be um, that we are open to constantly evolving we're constantly work striving to meet the learner that's in front of us right there in that moment mm-hmm. rather than being you know constantly oh well, this is the way it should be mm-hmm. should mm-hmm. be done so that bringing that kind of presence to our work um, And in that, in the context of holistic education, we're weaving in uh, critical pedagogy, so uh, Mm -hmm. the focus on social justice. Um, um, We're, like I I mentioned, the spiritual developmentalism models that would be like the Montessori and and Waldorf that we're, Mm -hmm. you know, we're looking at this, the unfolding soul within the child and working to kind of meet that in these different ages and stages of development. Mm -hmm. Um, so let's see, um, we're really focused on relationship based learning, like that the quality of our relationships determines the quality of our learning. Learning really Mm -hmm. only happens through relationship. Right. So that is, um, that's really important for us as well. So these are all, that's, you know, zooming out a little bit and giving that, uh, context is what we're up to Mm -hmm. there. And then, you know, in, in terms of things that I would be concerned about or things that I think about beyond our school, mm-hmm. coming back to the social justice piece, you know, it's, I do have um, some, con- some, uh, I'll put it this way, we're always working to make our model available to mm. families that want to be there, um, but and we run on, you know, not, 90 some percent tuition on right. I mean we run on 90 some percent on tuition right um, okay. and we uh, have started the whole life learning foundation and oh, so we we raise you know we do fundraisers all year and um, that goes towards scholarships and tuition assistance mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but I would really like to see and I'm curious to ask you about your vision for this as well I would really like to see more of holistic education available to families and children all mm-hmm. over the country and the world that, you know, right now it's, it really only happens in private schools or mm-hmm. homeschooling, you know, or homeschooling right. um, co-ops and, and things like that. Um, as far as I know, and right. I've looked into the, um, the charter process it is daunting <laughs> to say the least yeah it is yeah. like six percent at least in texas it's something like six percent of charters get approved and it's oh, wow. you basically have to have it, make it your full-time job to work on the application which is like a doctorate thesis by yes. the time it's done and it um what I'd like to see is, you know, some of these micro schools that are doing really amazing things mm-hmm. um, from, you know, around the country, around the world, be credited for the kinds of things that they're doing. Like right. when I told you the story of, of Faye, you know, as we as we open, there's amazing things happening um, at our school community and, and around the country. And I think that it's that is being ig- ignored or unsupported at the peril of our society. Right, right. Um, and, and, and this society uh, that, that, we, that champions the free market and, you know, like says there should be a, um, 
a, a diverse competitive ecosystem everywhere but no wait in education <laughs> no no it should be one monolithic standardized way of doing things yeah, that is yeah. you know just controlled by the dollar the purse strings at the top it makes no sense to me and i have not been able to uh you know i i, I am called Mm -hmm. to work on that right. and it's it is quite daunting right. to right. to find to try to find a way in to you know <laughs> um get through the cracks and yeah. so that's that's something that does come that is in my on my heart and mind yeah definitely yeah there's there's a lot of good stuff actually going on uh, developing in that direction um there's the micro schools as you said you know are, are becoming a thing there's actually a national micro school center um uh, that that is actually doing good work and is getting funding from like uh, the uh, forgetting what the name of the foundation is, um, but it, it used to be one of the Koch brothers' uh, foundation. But he seems to have you know <laughs> become enlightened or something because all of a sudden uh -huh. he's doing this this funding that's that's really going to a lot of alternatives um, that are not necessarily like I I, w I wouldn't have thought someone with his political views would have been doing this kind of work, but it's now happening. So, um, mm -hmm. it's great. Uh, so, so, so there's a lot of progress. Um, if you, if you, uh, like Carrie McDonald writes a lot about, uh, micro schools and, and homeschooling and, and things like that. So she's a good resource for, for kind of keeping in touch with what's going on. Mm -hmm. Um, because I, and, and, and there are, you know, part of what putting this, thing together, you know, the eject schools is about sort of how can we get out there? How can we get uh, a little better representation? And I bring sort of a, a certain perspective to it um, because I've, you know, written some books and, and things that uh, and, and bring, bring, bringing a perspective from uh, psychology into this and saying, wait a minute, there's actually some things we really need to pay attention to at a more basic level. Uh, my, my analogy to it is like, you know, energy abundance is possible when we pay attention to physics. Mm -hmm. We don't live at the level that physics studies. <laughs> you know, like they're talking about subatomic sub stuff. You know, like nuclear energy, solar energy. Einstein actually did both. Uh, is responsible partly for for a lot of that because he actually his Nobel Prize was for the photoelectric effect, not mm -hmm. for E equals mz squared. He didn't win a Nobel for that. Okay, uh -huh. that was his minor work. His major work, <laughs> according to the Nobel Committee, was the photoelectric effect, which eventually is is enabling solar power to happen. Right. So he's responsible, in a way, for both solar and <laughs> nuclear. So uh, pretty interesting. <laughs> but we have to pay attention to that lower level to get the abundance that we need at a higher level. And I think that psychology is now in a place where we can look at a lower level, at a learning level, and understand that instruction can happen in a different way than it used to. Mm -hmm. um, and th that's what my new book is more focused on, um, is really saying, okay, w we, we have learned certain things in psychology. And, and we can particularly look at autonomy, competence, and relatedness, self-determination mm -hmm. theory, if you're familiar with that, yes. um, is that, that once you really start to support that, then you're going to get a different result. And that the, the primary challenge in the mainstream is that they don't understand that. And mm -hmm. they're, a lot of the stuff that they do is counterproductive to that. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why I focus, for instance, we talk about academics. Academics is interesting. It's, you know, it's important in its way. But what, what most schools don't realize is that the learning process, particularly around autonomy and relatedness, are actually the foundations for that to be effective. And when you have a school system that doesn't give kids enough autonomy just to make decisions, to be the source of, you know, like you talk about facilitating and paying attention to what is, who is this and how are they, how do we support them? Um, is that's, that's a different approach than I have the math you need and, you know, I'm mm -hmm. your access to that. Um, and, and you have to have to obey me in order to get that. Um, and so, well, you know, we can actually have it be a conversation uh, instead of just a, a dictation. Um, and, and that supports that relatedness. It supports the, better supports mm -hmm. the autonomy. It doesn't mean you don't have structures around academics. It means that how they show up for that maybe needs to be different is, uh, yeah. 
you know, it, it, it's really enabling that trust to be there as the foundation for the instruction to go on. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. That's that, that context that we create, right? right. That's the, the social constructivism where mm -hmm. we are mm -hmm. making meaning. I'm helping you discover your own meaning. Right. Not just, you're not just this tabula rasa, you know, right, right. blank slate that I, I, I am tasked to fill with knowledge, but you are generating. And by the way, it's a lot more effective right. <laughs> this way, right? As psychology, research-based methods will show us that it's yep. more effective. It's, it's it, that, that learning is going to land. It's going to make more connections, you know, more exactly. synapses are exactly. going to, to fire and wire around that. And it's going to, mm -hmm. it's going to, they can take that into the rest of their lives. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the, that's where if we tune into the learning in a new way based on the psychology, then instruction takes on everything. And, it, and it's interesting. One of the things that has, you know, usually happens is that practice precedes theory mm -hmm. and practice in the it, Montessori Waldorf uh, you can you, you have De Summerhill democratic schools uh, those are a hundred years that you know we're talking they've been the practices have been in place a long long time yeah. but they've been marginal to the industry and that's the that's the right. that's the thing that, that boggles my mind um, when I really start looking at this and going what <laughs> you know mm -hmm. we, in many ways we do actually know how this works and we've known for a long time in a certain way but there's certain societal patterns that interfere with that and 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 so like like that's why i always talk about the education myths is i bring that up is like there's all these kind of ways that our society thinks about education that are just simply wrong right in the same way that we used to think about disease in a certain way. We thought it was in the air. We thought it was the miasma. It's like, well, that was wrong. <laughs> now, that doesn't mm -hmm. mean there isn't poison gases that can happen, but it's like, but you have to put it into this context. And and I, actually, uh, it was really funny. I had, I was, I was bringing up this thing about germ theory, right? And then I had mm -hmm. a friend and she was like, well, you know, germ theory is wrong. And I was like, wait, what? And what she means is that, uh, what she meant is that the germ theory is not complete. Mm -hmm. and, he, and she's right is that it's more complete than miasma theory, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but it's still not complete. And if, you know, when you look at how, um, you know, how, how difficult it was to deal with a pandemic, well, right. part of the reason we had a pandemic is because there's a whole bunch of things that we're doing that make that more likely. Mm -hmm. And that means we didn't understand, we don't understand germ theory enough to prevent it. When right. we really understand germ theory, when we really, when it really gets more complete, then we won't have pandemics because we will be doing things differently such that that's just not something that will arise. And so that's, that's how I see education needs to transform is how do we, well, one, we have to understand learning appropriately. So, so, so we have to get there first, like a, not first, but, but there has to be an understanding enough, like we make that transition from, miasma to germ theory mm -hmm. um, but even even right. whatever we come up with won't be complete it won't be done <laughs> it's never ending, right. it's never ending. Uh, but we have to get on a firmer foundation at this point and, yeah. and that's an important part <laughs> right yeah it seems that at the the larger higher levels to transform education does require a paradigm shift you know, right. from this industrial model um, mindset that we've got to move the kids down the conveyor belt and right. you know and, and they're gonna get um you know they're gonna get batched and stamped and move move along and they're um you know they're not gonna get be, they're not gonna be behind they're gonna be right right, right right on the conveyor belt right where they should be and um be good little workers and that that is well the irony is that they're not Right. Is that, that the, not the, in the 21st century they're they're not right. going to the factories you know this isn't well, this was observed. I mean, uh, um, I forget the, the the one of the big sociologists a hundred years ago was saying this isn't working. <laughs> you know, like, like it's never worked. <laughs> it's just that we've we've had we've generated abundance in spite of ourselves. We've right. generated you know wealth and and a variety of things, health indeed, um, out of doing certain things really poorly, namely mm -hmm. education. And mm -hmm. so and so that's the thing that that 
it, you know, getting the shift so that we're um, uh, uh, taking that next step. And and a paradigm shift is not just, you know, uh, you, you can't just say that paradigm doesn't work. You actually have to have something to put in its place. Right. <laughs> uh, and and that's actually you know part of the focus of my next book is is to really concisely say. Here's the replacement, and and it's something that that John Dewey predicted in 1938, in mm -hmm. his book to Experience in Education. Um, he said, he, he, so he's speaking to a convention of progressive educators, his people, yes. you know, like the movement yes. he started, and he says, you don't know what you're doing, and I know you don't know what you're doing because I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, in order for me to know what I'm doing, I have to be able to reliably distinguish an educative experience from a non-educative experience. And I can't mm -hmm. do that yet. The only way you can, the, the way he will know that's true is when you have a proper theory of experience. And in, he, he died in 1952, so 24 years at the end of his life. The last book of original work that he published on education was the one in 1938. He spent mm -hmm. the next 24 years, the rest of his life, trying to figure out a theory of experience, and he didn't succeed because, mainly, he didn't have cognitive psychology. Mm -hmm. And so that's the thing that has changed now that he couldn't, you know, he couldn't resolve that issue. Um, and then I think that most people have forgotten that he said that, <laughs> uh, especially in education. It's like, you know, I've been for many years kind of trying to figure this stuff out. And then when I read that, I was like, oh, my God, <laughs> he nailed it. You know? <laughs> there it is. And, and self-determination theory, to me, I'm, what I'm proposing in my new books is just to say, look, self-determination theory is the theory of experience that John Dewey said we needed that because it can for. positively distinguish an educative experience from a non-educative one. And it's very relatively simple. It says, well, when you're fully engaged, it's educative. And it you're doesn't learning. matter what it was. Yeah. It doesn't matter what the content was. Yeah. And he said that himself in that book. He said, it is not, there's no such thing as an educative, like there's no such thing as an e education in the, in the abstract. It has to be specific. It's that learner being engaged with that, whatever it is. It can be any activity, can mm -hmm. be educative if they're fully engaged with it. And you have to now, part of the, the challenge is also that you have to have some technical understanding of what engagement means. Because we're not talking about they just look interested. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not just they do the go through the motions. That is not what we're talking about. <laughs> Fold out the worksheet. <laughs> yeah, right. It, what? You know, now we, we're good, right? <laughs> so, so that's that's where it's really juicy right now, um, and it's the book that's you know I'm just getting it drafted now, but um, but really getting that clear, um, getting some technical details behind it, so we can say how do we know this is going on. Um, a lot of people don't realize that we can actually measure engagement in a pretty reliable way, uh, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and not just the behavioral stuff, not just, uh, you know, but actually finding out, are they putting themselves into that learning, into that situation? Mm -hmm. um, so that's, ex that's the exciting piece to me is like, I'm not just another complainer about the way things are. Um, I, I may not have, you know, I, I did homeschool other people's kids for about five years way back uh, even though I, so I didn't start a school but <laughs> um, mm -hmm. but I think I think we have this uh, piece that we can we can bring forward and 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 go to a school like yourself and say okay you know you're doing great work let's let's actually put some put some things around that that are consistent with your vision and your your actual evolved practice of how you do things mm -hmm. and say Here's a data set that could actually tell you that you're doing exactly what you say you're doing or, or not. Right. And then you could, but, but by having that feedback, you'd actually manage that and say, okay, we need to do better on maybe it's autonomy support can, or it's maybe right. it's do better on the, the competence support. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I mean, I know what the parameters are because we know that it's autonomy. It's going to come down to autonomy, competence, and relatedness um, in one way or another. Um, or, or actually, there is another category of need, um, what I call uh, particular needs. So it's not just those universal ones. Autonomy, competence, and relatedness are universal to all humans. But there's also things that are specific to your culture or your situation or your, who you are as an individual. So there are mm -hmm. needs there, too. It's just that they're unique, <laughs> like Literally, right. <laughs> uh, and and so and so once we get those things 
to where we're actually having meaningful measures of them and meaningful measures in, in where I can go to someone like you and say, let's, let's measure these things. And you can say, yeah, okay, let's do that. You know, it, and not feel like you're compromising your practice mm -hmm. by doing it. Um, and that's the thing that's, that's juicy to me is like, you know, we can have the conversation and find out, you know, I, I, um, how's this working? Where's the, what's the evidence? Let's yeah. see. And it's not compromising. It's actually, um, you know, providing more visibility into the methods and into their effectiveness and right. help, right. Helping that helps us evolve. Exactly. That's what it's all about, exactly. right. Evidence based, um, you know, research based theories where, and then where, where does the rubber hit the road? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, I so I can't, I can't wait for the book. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we'll have to get you the, the, the pre pre publication version. Um, so let's wrap this up for the, our listeners. Um, and l give, give us a sense of where they can plug in, find out more uh, about what you do. So we, you can find us on the interwebs at whole life learning center.com. Mm -hmm. You can learn more about our foundation or if you're called to support our, our mission and vision, um, you can uh, find that at whole, whole life learning foundation dot org. Nice. Um, by the way, our mission is to inspire lifelong learners, creative change makers and conscientious leaders for a more equitable, just and sustainable world. So that is what we're up to. And if you want to join in that in that mission with us, we'd I'd love to meet you. Great, great. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you all for listening. I appreciate it. Likewise, thank you, Doug. All right.